The most important thing in this car is the battery, short of a driver. The battery itself should be as big as you can buy. And I do mean big, meaning amperage and hour ratings. This one that's equipped in this vehicle is 850 cold cranking amps. This is rated at zero degrees. Don't be fooled by the folks that tell you that they got 850 cranking amps at 32 degrees because that's not the same. I'm sure we'll all agree that our car will start much easier at just below freezing than it will at zero degrees outside. Always look for the cold cranking amp symbol, which is CCA. This one's 850. The batteries that I like and the ones that I've used most successfully are the ones that are built by a company called Johnson Controls. Johnson Controls is the company that initially contracted to Sears to build the Sears Die Hard. All the reputation of Sears Die Hard up until the new generation, not to be confused with the old generation Sears Die Hard, was built by Johnson Controls. A first grade Johnson Control battery is one called Interstate and they're available all over the United States. I don't know why anybody would buy another battery. I've sold them now for 20 plus years. They get the best warranty and they have a product that is quality wise untouchable. The other thing that Johnson Controls did not do is remake the wheel. This battery bracket that Nissan supplies for the original equipment, this is a, a brand new one. They're all they are, all they are is just basically a piece of stamped metal that's got some paint on it and they don't last long so you, you want to take and replace this as often as possible. They're $15 new. Part number on this one is a 24420-E, we call that Edward, 46 Zero, zero. Again, 24420 Edward 4600. These are available from Nissan. I stock them in boxes of 10 and better. The problem that you run into is that the Nissan bracket only has a, a hold down lip that's approximately 3 eighths of an inch wide. If you use a Excite battery, which is every other battery out there, I mean, I'm not kidding you, they're, they're marketed under a thousand names, but they're all built by Excite. They're too narrow for this. And what will happen is that the battery will fall through, and when it does, it will take and snap upward, shorting out to the chassis your positive side, and things are going to get hot in a hurry. The only battery that will fit in here really tightly is one which is designed to be the size of the original 24 series batteries. Now this one's a 24F, and F originally stood for Ford, uh, it was a reverse terminal. This one, originally your, hot, your positive terminal was over here. This one actually is your positive terminal here and the negative terminal here. I quit using the original 24 series batteries because of the propensity to short out to this portion of the body. Major electrical fires have occurred because of this. Buy a 24F. You will have to change your cables, but at least the positive will be out here where it won't be shorting out either to the hood, and if the negative does get over here, no big deal. The battery itself, if it's a correct size, fits the bracket, bolts up to the firewall here, and this pull-down bolt, if you can't, if you don't know what else to do, buy the original parts. They're not that expensive. And bolt this down and do it nice and solid. Secondly, to protect this portion of the battery tray, the metal portion which holds this battery up, always keep the plastic tray in good condition. This is the original Nissan one. And this part number is 24428 Nancy 3600. The, it comes with an extra plastic tube to drain any vented acids that might be sloshing out of the battery. Plugs into the bottom of it and then it runs down through and into the and off and safely drains any acid away from the, the, the metallic portions of the chassis. If you've never had to replace one of these battery bracket holders underneath here. Believe me, it is a career. It's welded in and it doesn't like coming out. The best idea is never to have to ever replace one. The way to do that is use a good battery with a good vapor recovery system. This is probably as good as it gets. I've had famous luck with these. Secondly, when you go to take the original cables, you're going, one of them is going to be longer than the other, obviously. The negative in the early days was shorter and the positive was longer. It is difficult to reverse these two effectively because of the shape of the positive, the size of the positive and negative terminals themselves. I like to build my own cables because I get a better cable than I can buy downtown. Most of the cables that you're going to buy are going to have approximately 30 to 40 strands of heavy wire copper in them. The original cable from Nissan had hundreds and hundreds of strands and 
That's the price difference between an original equipment cable and the one that uh, you get downtown. Don't confuse what you're paying for. You get what you pay for when it comes to, to a battery cable. We'll take, and take these new ends like this. Peel back the plastic. These are then inserted. And we hold them up and we warm this end until the solder will flow into these and we solder these down. We then insert a piece of heat shrink over the end of the wire and it will slide over it because I always forget to do it before I put it together. And then with a match or a hot air gun you can shrink these down. And when you're through, they'll look just like this. These, I have both red and, and uh, black heat shrink to keep these. This seals the air off of the connection. There is no corrosion that can occur at that point in time. The original clamps that came with the battery cables themselves was attached right to the end, just like this. The problem is that's the end that goes bad the first. So rather than buy a new cable each time, I've gone to using marine style terminals. These are all lead. They're a good solid lead connection. These I get from NAPA. They're a good quality. I get one of the same quality each time I bought them and I've used them for years. These you can put on either end if you want to. And the nice thing about it is so many of us have got driving lights, an extra stereo, a memory circuit, or maybe our car alarm or something else that needs to be attached here. This bolt is so tall that all you have to do is take this nut off and you can stack, shoot, as many. You've got your positive supply to your starter, here's the fuel injection positive supply here, and the fuel injection negative supply over here, plus you've got an extra power wire for the stereo, etc, etc, etc. You can stack many things on here and it's nice to be able to ground it. The most important thing to remember about the early style fuel injection system is that they had a designated ground and a designated power supply. And unfortunately, Nissan in its wisdom color coded both wires red. <laughs> if you ever reverse them, God help you. If you ever pull them, they're, they're located right here in the main harness. They come across the firewall assembly from the main fuel injection relay, the, du the dual master relay, which is located up underneath the driver's kick well. The positive supply is the same color as the, as the negative supply. Now, I've protected this line even more so in the repair that I made of this so that this wire would not be confused with this one. It's shorter. I've deliberately shortened it up. It can't physically get over here. This long one has been extended so that the ground for the fuel injection is truly sensed at the battery. It's not hooked to the chassis with all the interference that can come from that. These two wires cannot be reversed. When you go into service this battery and your fuel injection, make sure that these wires are good, clean, solid connections, they're soldered, and that they are well sealed. Now you can see there's a bit of shine on top of this. This is a battery sealer. I don't recommend the gooey ones because it, it just makes a mess of it. The only thing we're trying to do here is stop the oxidation. If you can stop the oxidation, this will stay looking like this for years. I love to do this on all of my customers' vehicles because if they ever bring it back in and the oxidation's broken off or it's, the uh, coating's cracked, I know they've jump-started it. And uh, that's a big, big no-no. Never, 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 never jump-start one of these cars. If you have a dead battery, Go down and get another battery. The price of one electrical component, either your alternator, your regulator, your electronic ignition module, or your electronic control unit for the fuel injection is not worth risking for the price of one jump start because you were just too big a hurry to get the right battery. If you left your lights on and you need to charge the battery up, call a wrecker, tow the thing home, take it to a shop, release these, and remove one cable. I don't care if it's positive or negative, but release all the cables off of one side. Then charge the battery. When the battery is fully charged, reattach it. It's the only way not to do damage to this system. I can't tell you how important it is not to ever jumpstart this car or jumpstart this car to another vehicle. Unfortunately, it's the Good Samaritan who winds up paying the price for that because the guy with the dead battery generally drives away and the person who was nice enough to stop and help him out winds up paying, their, paying the, the, for the price of repairing all the components they damaged while doing so. If you're going to take and do a jumpstart, and you have no choice, it's an emergency situation. Attach your positive cable, your, just one cable. Go from your positive wire here, over to the positive of the car that you're working on, and then physically connect either the bumpers if they're metal, or go over to some other portion of the vehicle. But do not come over here to the start to the negative side of the battery and connect those two together. What happens is that nobody remembers to shut the car off. If you're going to jumpstart somebody, the best way to do it would be to remove your wires, hook onto this, jumpstart their car, 
shut the, get the wires disconnected and reconnect yours. But if you don't have any tools to do so, do not hook the negative side up. Hook the negative over to a post or some other portion of good, solid, clean metal that you can utilize and it will act, the rest of the car will act as a heat sink for when you disconnect the charging system because your alternator is going to see that dead battery and it's going to go to a full charge. And your system doesn't need a full charge. Their system needs a full charge. So when you disconnect, suddenly that alternator is going to spike. And when it spikes, you're going to an alternator spike and it's going to flood your electronic ignition with a voltage it cannot handle and you will do damage to it. You might not know it today, but it will eventually die on you. So no jump starting. Let's just get that straight before we ever go any further. If you have to jump start, make it a life and death situation. No other reason for it. Once the battery's bolted in and you've got good solid positive uh, leads down to your starter, you've got good com completely clean new fittings, lines, solder everything. If you don't want an older clone of soldering gun, get one and learn how to use it. Don't crimp anything. We just finished doing a car here the other day that is going to literally cost the gentleman more than it ever should have simply because nothing was crimped properly. Honestly, the, the factory all crimps their, their, their fittings, but they have a special crimper that does the job and it does a good job of it. But soldering is the only way for the, the aftermarket people like you and I to be able to, to make sure that the connection stays clean. The early 1975-1976 fuel injection systems use designated power and designated ground. These two wires go directly across the front of the firewall, down underneath, up into the dash, and connect directly to the main master fuel injection relay. This relay is the only one that looks like it in the whole car. You needn't worry about it. It's twice as wide as any relay in the whole car. It's twice as long as it is wide, and it has multiple connectors on it. I have a, a diagram of that relay, how it functions, and uh, one of those will be included with each one of these videos to help simplify diagnosis of whether that relay is bad. Don't run out and buy one of those relays because once you order it and it shows up, they're going to make you buy it, and it's over a hundred bucks. So this video alone could save you the price of having to buy that relay because you're trying to isolate a no-start condition in your car. That relay and diagnosis. Uh, this is all written in English, induced by a corrosion anywhere underneath the hood. And if if you can open your hood and see any growth or corrosion in this area of white powdery substance, you are causing your fuel injection some very bad days and nights. Get this cleaned up first. Check to make sure that this alternator is charging. Not, that's not the easiest thing to do, but those of you with voltmeters, uh, you'll have a voltmeter in, in there. They're not the most accurate, but they do have an indication of whether um, the system is working properly. You don't want to see anything more than about 14, 14 half volts right at the battery. You may see a little more down at the alternator if you were to take a digital voltmeter and check either one of them. But you do not want to over voltage and you don't want to under voltage. Somewhere around 14 and a half volts at the battery keeps the battery charged nicely and uh, won't kill your system. It's designed to run with that kind of voltage. Again, the alternator, if the belt is slipping, you're going to have, <laughs> you're going to have, AC, you're going to have uh, fuel injection problems from the very beginning. A very simple way of testing to see if the belt is, is tight enough is to take one thumb and push down on the blade of the flat portion of the blades on the, air, the alternator cooling fan in opposite the direction of rotation. Now, the direction of rotation is clockwise. Pushing down counterclockwise, if the belt will turn, it is, if the pulley will spin or will move within the belt, it's too loose. You'll have to tighten it up, either replace the belt, if, it's still, if you tighten it up and it's still too tight, and if the belt itself is very tight but still spins, you have a bad pulley or a bad belt, replace either one. If you do not, if you just tighten it up and leave it at that, hoping that's what you're going to do, the next thing you'll be buying is a water pump because you're not water pump bearings out. So get, the, get that taken care of. What we really need here is a perfect voltage signal. The, this system was originally designed by the Bosch injection folks and the rights to it were uh, given to the Nissan people to produce them. It's done under JECS, JEX um, injection, and it's a good system. It's identical to the Bosch, but you won't see any part numbers on any of the cars after a very few of the production run numbers in early 1975. Everything else after that will have JEX and part numbers on it. Every once in a while you'll pick up an injector and it'll have a Bosch 10-digit part, 10 part number on it, and you'll go, oh, yeah, it's an early part. You keep stressing the uh, importance of the, of the uh, electrical system as being crucial to the operation of the fuel injection. What, what percentage of your cars come in with fuel injection problems and end up being wiring? 
90% of them come in with a bad alternator, a dead battery, or a battery that's on its last legs, a starter that's eating too much amperage, causing the alternator to overcharge, which overcharges the entire system. The fuel injection tries to compensate for it. It cannot. Either it fries out the windings in the uh, master fuel injection relay, or on and on and on. Rather than try to get yourself too complicated about that, the best tip is don't get these problems started. Fixing them after the fact is 10 times more expensive than if you just bought the best band of matter you can buy.